Have I ever told you what the meaning of the word cathedral is? Cathedral comes from the Latin for cathedra, because uh, it, cathedra meaning chair. The first four centuries of the church, uh, everyone preached sitting down. And wherever the bishop had his chair, his cathedra, that was his cathedral. So, this is how most people preached for centuries. I don't like it, but life. When did you read Revelation for the first time? Years ago. Anyone remember it distinctly? College and religion class. College and religion class right? Well, first time when you read Revelation, what did you think of it? Scary, scary right? Scary? Confusing? Not quite sure what to make of this. First time I read Revelation, I was at a church camp, and I uh, snuck a flashlight into my... Uh, uh, sleeping bag. I figured if I got in trouble for staying up past lights out, I was reading Revelation. They can't give me too much flack. And uh, I was confused by it and I did not like it and so I basically ignored it from then on out. Uh, really until uh, I went off to learn uh, and be a pastor. That whole seminary thing. And I did what most people do with Revelation. I just ignored it. And so today I, I want to apologize to you on behalf of the church for leaving you uh, uninformed about how to read Revelation. There, are, there is a good and healthy way to read Revelation such that it's not scary and such that it's good news, but the church has done a really bad job of doing that, of teaching that for, for a long time now. And so I, I feel like the church owes you an apology for that. The person who taught me to read Revelation well, to read it, uh, to read it as a book of hope, as it is meant to be, is a guy by the name of uh, Mickey Eford. A guy who, when I ha first had him in class, he had been teaching for longer than I had been alive. He had, that's how long he had been teaching uh, class at, at Duke at that point. And he had made it his mission to teach churches, to teach people how to read the Bible and read it well. And so I'm going to teach you as I have taught, and uh, it may rock the boat a bit. Um, that's what happens when you talk about Revelation. If you preach it... Uh, People either ignore it or they get really serious about it, and the people who ignore it don't want to, don't want to touch it because it's scary, and those who get really serious about it, you know, they... Uh, I'm going to probably disabuse you of a few ideas in the coming minutes and, and weeks, and, and, and just hold on to that. This is, this, hold on. Here, here is the most important thing to hold on to as you read the book of Revelation. It is a letter of hope for persecuted Christians. That's what this is. Revelation is a letter of hope for persecuted Christians. If any, if ever, ever you have any doubt about what's happening in, in, in the book of Revelation, you remember that, you're going to get back on track. It's a letter of hope for persecuted Christians. We're going to take a look at that, uh, this letter, a little bit of it today. And we're going to get into it by, by looking at, uh, thinking about political cartoons. Because political cartoons are, are a genre that we know fairly well here in America. And, and you know, I look at political cartoons, you know what the pol political cartoons teach me? That if I wanted to go elephant hunting, the thing I should do is get some donkeys and put them on leashes and take them into the bush, right? Because those are the natural enemies of elephants, donkeys. That's what we see all the time in, in political cartoons, right? Elephants and donkeys fighting. Not really. It, it's not meant to be taken literally, is it? An elephant and a donkey fighting, what's that mean? It means that Republicans and Democrats are at odds. And so we know how to read a political cartoon, and we know what all the symbols mean, don't we? If you see a, an elephant, what's that stand for? Okay, donkey, what's that stand for? Nine people in long black robes, what's that? Supreme Court. Black dude with big ears? President Obama, right? You go through these, are, you haven't seen that? It's, well, I see that all the time. Yeah, there are caricatures we have of people in uh, political cartoons, thin black glasses and bright red lipstick. Who's that? Sarah Palin. Right? You, you know this without, if you see a political cartoon, you know how to understand the symbol, symbols of the political cartoon, and you know what to take from it, and you know not what to take from it. Would you ever use a political cartoon to understand geography? No, because they reduce job. I mean, they never get it to scale. And you would never look at it to try to understand exactly what a person looks like. Every person who shows up in a political cartoon is a caricature. Right? So political cartoons, we understand because we live in the 21st century America. We understand 21st century American political cartoons. In many ways, trying to read the book of Revelation 
is like someone from the seventh century Spain trying to read politi political s cartoons from this time period. You could do it, but you'd have to get educated about the politics of the time. And so if we're going to go back and read Revelation, the first challenge is that we need to understand the symbols. We under need to understand the symbols, the numbers, the colors, in the same way that we understand that a tall dude with a beard that's red, white, and blue with a top hat is Uncle Sam. Right? We need to be able to make those connections. And so I've given you a list, if you didn't grab one on the way in, grab one on the way out. There's a, a list of rules for reading apocalypses. The book of Revelation, the genre is an apocalypse. And what you have here is a list of rules. For example, every number means something other than the number. That, for example, let, let me parse that out. Uh, three is always the number of heaven, the realm of the spirit. Seven is always the number of completion. Ten is always the number of inclusion. Twelve is always the number of the people of God. If you see twelve in Revelation, it has nothing to do with twelve things. It has to do with twelve tribes of Israel or twelve disciples. It has to do with the entirety of the people of God. And we'll get into this in a while um, when we look at the end, but uh, the tw the the city of God that comes that has twelve that has twelve gates and twelve stones, that's where the twelve people live, the all of God's people, because twelve means God's people. And so other things, if something is measured, it is protected. Uh, w colors all have meaning. Uh, black means the absence of something. Red means war. Take this with you, and as we look through Revelation, keep this right there next to you. And then on the opposite side of it is a schedule. This is what we're going to be looking at between now and Easter. And so, uh, read ahead if you want. Read ahead, take a look at it, bring your questions. I'll answer any questions you have at the end of the sermons. And I can't promise I'll have all the answers, but I'll take a swing at them. And, and as you can see, all the chapters, that we're not going to go through the chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. Because an apocalypse is non-chronological. It's not going in order of time. It's topically arranged, not chronologically arranged. So you don't have to read it in, in order to, to understand it. Um, this is not meant to be a timeline. This is meant to be a letter to give persecuted Christians hope. So we're going to start today with, uh, not with the beginning, usually we start with the beginning, a very good place to start and all that, but uh, Revelation, like the book of Job, makes no sense unless you know the ending. If you don't know the ending, if you don't know the, the hope that you're driving to, what ends up happening is you get in the middle of the, on the, you start reading, you get to the middle of the book, and you get into the fourth trumpet, or the third seal, or the, or the, the, next, uh, the next beast that comes up, and you think, oh my God, this is confusing, I'm done, move on. And, and so read Revelation, you've got to have the ending clearly in mind. Um, and so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to start with the ending to make sure we understand the hope that this letter offers. Now, this hope is not going to come across as quite as powerfully as it would have to the first audience because <clears throat> this is the second challenge of reading Revelation. The first challenge is we don't know the symbology of the time. The second challenge is we're not persecuted Christians. Remember, this is a letter to pers of hope for persecuted Christians. Anyone here feel persecuted for your faith? Right? We're, we're not. And so, this is hope given to a specific people at a specific time. And, and it's, it's important for us, but it's not quite as important as it was to them, or as it is to other persecuted Christians in other lands, such as, say, Coptic Christians right now. So we're going to take a look. We're going to start with Revelation 21. Uh, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Does this mean that we're all going to go thirsty at the end of Revelation? No sea anymore? Well, this is the first symbol we look at. What? Go back to Genesis 1.1, when the Spirit of God is moving across the what? The waters. That's where how creation begins. He's mo the Spirit of God is moving across the waters, the waters of chaos. And, so, and then in Revelation 13... The beast, beasts all stand for nations. When the beast comes up out of the waters. And so the waters of chaos, the waters where the beast or, or nations come from that persecute Christians, to say the sea is no more is not to say we're going to go thirsty. It means that you don't have to worry about chaos anymore. You don't have to worry about more nations to rise to persecute you. Moving on, it says, Death will be no more, mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. Well, why is death stopped? 
because persecution has ended. The persecution that they're enduring is the persecution under the emperor Domitian in the years in the mid 90s. This letter was written in 94 to 95, and Domitian dies in 96. And so to say that death is no more is to say that Domitian will stop persecuting you. And this comes from a time when. Uh, some of the emperors had used Christians uh, as torches, douse them in pitch or pine tar, tie them to a tree and light them on fire to light the, uh, the, the emperor's feasts. And that was how he, and so the idea that death would be no more and, and Christians would stop being used as tiki torches, that would be a good thing, right? So we, <clears throat> we continue reading. Uh, the one who was seated on the throne say, said, uh, See, I am making all things new. Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The promise Revelation makes is that God is there at the beginning and the end of all parts of our lives. Alpha and Omega. Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. It would be like saying A to Z to today. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, the murderers, the fornicators, the sorcerers, idolaters, liars, their place will be in the lake that burns with fire and suffer, which is the second death. Those who turn away from God will not only face the first death, which we all face, we all will die, but the second death is separation from God. That's something that they choose for themselves. And what we see here is a pretty black and white situation, right? You follow God, great. You don't follow God, you're burning. In apocalyptic situations, when members of your community are being used as torches, everything gets very black and white. There's not, many, there's not much room for shades of gray when this is the level of concern you have for the safety of your family. And in the spirit, he carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and the gates had twelve angels, and the gates are inscribed with the names of the twelve tribes of Israelites. God will provide this place for 12 to live. What is 12? 12 is God's people. And then the angel who talked to me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city. The city lies four square, its length the same of its width, and he measured the city with his rod 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. In an apocalypse, whatever is measured is protected. That's how you declare, this is now protected by the one who measures it. And it's measured as a cube, right? There's only one other cube in Scripture. It's the cube uh, that's the measured the space of uh, the Holy of Holies, the inner part of God's temple. And so to say that this is a cube is to say God will be with you in this city as God is, was with you at the temple that was destroyed. The wall is built of jasper, while the city is pure gold, clear as glass. The foundations of the wall of the city are adorned with every jewel. The first jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, onyx, carnelian, chrysolite, beryl, topaz, chrysoprase, jacinth, and amethyst. Amethyst, And the twelve gates are twelve pearls, and each of the gates is a single pearl, and the rest of the city is pure gold, transparent glass. This is a book of symbols. It's not an allegory. And the difference between the two is symbols have a, sim a meaning. Like this 12 stands for the people of God. If it was an allegory, every single detail would, would mean something. This is not an allegory. The fact that there are 12 different types of stones representing the 12 different types of people, they're precious stones, so God's people are precious, but that's it. There is no hidden meaning in the 12 different types of stone. There's no like secrets to be unpacked. There's no Bible code here. Somehow mystic voodoo, you can tell, tell the future because of the order of the stones. Nope, just 12 precious stones because God's people are precious. Who is it that said sometimes a cigar is a cigar? You've heard that phrase? I'm trying to remember. Sometimes it is exactly what it looks like. And that happens here in Revelation. But nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. If this is describing the end of all time, you might wonder, why does it talk about anyone who practices abomination still being around? This book was not written to a group of Christians who wanted to talk about the end of time. This book was written to a group of Christians in the year 94 and 95 who needed to hear about the end of persecution right now. You're ta don't talk to me about the end times. Talk to me about this emperor leaving because my people are being tortured. All right? And so this is not 
trying to describe the end of all time. This is describing the end of the persecutions. And at the end of the persecutions in the year 96, there were still people around who would practice abominations and those who would lie. And that's okay. All right? This is not trying to describe the end of time. This is trying to describe the end of that particular time of persecution. Right? <clears throat> that's the original context of it. Now, once you're through the persecution, Revelation 22 tells us that we as Christians get back to doing what we are meant to do. Uh, then the angel showed me the river of life, bright as a crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the streets of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit. Twelve, so what are we talking about? People of God. And so the twelve kinds of fruit, what do they have next to them? The tree, the leaves that are for the healing of the nation. And so the people of God are meant to be working for the healing of the nation. All right, that is their, their purpose. Once persecution passes, then Christians can again focus on healing the nations. And, and so that's the end of the book. Right? The ending of this book gives hope for the people that persecution will end, that those who follow Jesus, that keep the faith that God's will is going to be done for them, a new day will dawn, and that's still true today. Just because it's... When something is true in Scripture, it is God's will that persecution ends. It was true then, it's true today, and it's, it's true tomorrow as well. And so, this is true for all Christians who are being persecuted. Persecution will, pa will pass, death, sickness, and persecution will not have the last word. That doesn't say, so to say that this is a book focused on the ending of the persecutions of the Christians in Rome in the years 94 and 95, that does not say it not, doesn't apply today, but it doesn't apply today in the way that it is usually applied. It applies today in the same way it applied then. Persecuted Christians can look to the future with hope. And we can look to the future with hope. That God's will is going to be done at the end of the day. God wins. That, that, that's sort of the punchline of, of Revelation. God is going to win. Not exactly what you expected, though, is it? <laughs> I want to invite you to continue to read Revelation with me up through Easter. Uh, and if you uh, want to read ahead, can you go to the next slide? This revelation for today, you can that book, it's uh, that skinny. You can read it in about two sittings, uh, at least I did. Uh, that will go through the entire book of Revelation, and, and it will show you how, what every symbol means. And, and go to the next slide. Left behind, that's the same author, and he instead of going through the book, the book of Revelation, this in this book, uh, it's 68 pages long, so it's rather short. Uh, Eford goes through the major symbols: uh, Antichrist, Millennium, Rapture, all these terms you hear tossed around, and, and gives context for where they come from. For things like, for example, the Antichrist, he's not in the book of Revelation, not at all. If you look for the word in the book, you won't find it. It's in a different book of the Bible and in a completely different context. And we're going to get to that in coming weeks. We're going to sit down and we will talk about how did Revelation get so messed up. We'll look at that, but, but, not, not, but not today. As I said, uh, bring your questions. Read ahead. Bring your questions. I'll answer them best I can. And uh, let me just tell you how much I'm looking forward to spending these coming weeks uh, exploring this letter, this letter of hope for persecuted Christians. Amen.